the argument about civil religion says, look, in our country, the only thing that unites all 330 million of us of different races, ethnicities, religions, customs, cultures, et cetera, is a belief in the promise in equality, liberty, democracy. Nothing else unites us except these ideals. The Village Square, a nervy bunch of liberals and conservatives who believe that disagreement and dialogue make for a good conversation, a good country, and a good time. At the Village Square, we talk about politics, religion, and race. You know, the topics your mom taught you never to discuss in polite company. Listen, at the Village Square, we make pigs fly. Welcome to Village Squarecast. This is Vanessa Rouse. Thanks for joining us for When the Stars Begin to Fall with Dr. Theodore R. Johnson. This episode title comes from Dr. Johnson's book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the Promise of America. We find Dr. Johnson's perspective on race in America truly extraordinary. He makes a persuasive and beautiful case for finding higher ground as a people together. He even shows us how to do it. And he makes us feel hopeful along the way. I really have no words that can compete with his, so here are a few of his words to set the stage. Despite maddening contradictions, I love America. I simply cannot help it. There is an undeniable and admirable strength in a nation that slowly but steadily groans toward the incorporation of those it used to exclude. We can't wait for you to hear more from Dr. Johnson in just a minute. Our facilitator, Dr. Nasheed Majuin, Executive Director of Florida Humanities, will tell you a little more about Dr. Theodore R. Johnson shortly. And speaking of Florida Humanities, we'd like to give a huge thanks to them for partnering with us to present this podcast series. Check them out online at floridahumanities.org to learn about the phenomenal programming they provide and support. We'd also like to share a quick word about Democracy Paradox, another podcast in the Democracy Group Network. On the Democracy Paradox podcast, you get to hear from scholars and thought leaders about democracy, democratization, and world affairs. And what makes them different from a lot of content out there is they manage to tackle extremely complex ideas without arrogance or condescension. They open up new ways to consider politics and world affairs by introducing us to change makers in this space. Like our very own Liz Joyner, she was featured on a recent episode and we're thankful to them for inviting her on. By the way, just a quick fun fact about the host of Democracy Paradox, Justin Kempf. He has a list of 100 books about democracy on his website, and guess what? He's read them all. That was a little humbling for me personally. You can check out that list and the podcast at democracyparadox.com or find Democracy Paradox in your favorite podcast app. All right, let's get on with the program. Here's Dr. Nasheed Majuin to introduce Dr. Theodore R. Johnson and When the Stars Begin to Fall. Dr. Majuin, take it away. Thanks, thanks. This is a wonderful, wonderful evening, and it's my pleasure to introduce our special guest. Dr. Theodore R. Johnson is a public policy scholar and military veteran who served as a White House fellow and speechwriter to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Ted is currently a senior fellow and director of the fellows program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. He holds a doctorate of law and policy and his research focuses primarily on African-American political behavior as well as civic solidarity. He is the author of the extraordinary book, When the Stars Begin to Fall, Overcoming Racism and Renewing the promise of America. This is an amazing speaker. He's doing some wonderful research. Ted, happy to have you. And I look forward to having a discourse with you. If you could tell us something about the overarching themes of your book. 
Yeah. So look, I appreciate y'all having me here tonight and very much looking forward to the conversation and the questions that will come afterwards. Um, so, you know, this book is kind of tough to talk about in a concise way. Uh, I often describe it as a three-legged stool of three-legged stools, yeah. which, and by this, I mean, it's like, it's, it's three batches of three ideas that I sort of smash together in hopes that I'm putting together a puzzle, a set of puzzle pieces that paint a picture that folks may may feel like they recognize but haven't really seen um, before. But if I were to walk you through each of these legs on these three stools, um, it, it'll feel a little like a graduate class in, uh, in sociology and political science. So instead, what I'll do is just tell you a story that conveys the broad okay. theme of the book. And then pull out some, tell you about the structure of the book, and then maybe we, I'll, uh, I'll stop there and we can have a conversation. So let's start with the story. All right. So I want to take you to 1960, 1961 in Northern Maryland. All right. This is a time when there are a number of nations in sub-Saharan Africa that are gaining their independence. And as these nations that used to be, you know, governed by uh, England and uh, Portugal and Spain and uh, France, um, as they're gaining their independence, they're beginning to name ambassadors to send to nations around the world. And of course, the United States was high on their list. So as these newly independent sub-Saharan African nations are sending ambassadors to the United States, one of the things ambassadors have to do is they usually arrived in New York where the United Nations is, and then they would jump in a car and drive from New York down to DC to present their credentials to the president of the United States. At this time, it was Kennedy and to the State Department. Okay, so this is also at a time when the, uh, the interstate system in the United States is still being built. So a lot of the pathways, the, the highways that these ambassadors are traveling are not the interstates we're familiar with today, but sort of the back highways that have you know, that were widely traveled then, but not so much, uh, not as much today. In the northeastern part of Maryland, Route 40 was one of the most well-traveled sections of highway between New York and Washington, D.C. Now, as these ambassadors were making the trip from New York down to Washington, D.C. to present their credentials, they would have to use the bathroom. They'd want some food, some coffee. Some of them would even want to stay the night before making the last hour or so and a half uh, drive to DC. But what they found was that the diners, the hotels along Route 40 in late 50s, early 60s were still segregated. Um, if you were a white trucker, you were more than welcome to have a coffee and get some eggs or whatever. But if you were black, period, you were not welcome. So one particular ambassador, his name was Adam Malik Sal from the newly independent nation of Chad. And Chad is a, uh, is a nation, the official language was French. So he wasn't an English speaker through his translator and driver. They decided to pull over on Route 40, stop at the Bonnie Bray Diner. His driver slash translator asked the diner owner there for a cup of coffee, and she told them to get out. And um, when she was asked later by Life magazine why she treated an ambassador so poorly, she said he looked like an average run of the mill N word to me. Um, I couldn't tell he was an ambassador. And of course, the N word wasn't Negro that she used um, in her mind. He was just another black guy. And like her, uh, her name was Mrs. Leroy Merritt is how she's credited in, the, in Life magazine. Um, she was just used to the American way of doing things, which was racial segregation. And um, she had no concern about the diplomacy happening or the national security concerns or foreign policy interests of the United States. She knew how we worked here in America domestically, and that was um, to segregate. Here's the, the problem. At the time that this is happening, we're in the middle of, the, of a Cold War, the United States, with the Soviet Union. And as we are telling the world that the United States is the place of equality and liberty and democracy, and that the Soviet Union's way of doing business, um, which pushes communism and control of the, of the people by the state is, is a bad way of doing things, we are segregating against the very people, um, you know, our own citizens, our fellow citizens. And these new nations in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well, in, as well as newly independent nations in Southeast Asia, et cetera, 
um, as they get their independence, there's a battle going on between the United States and the Soviet Union for influence over these newly independent nations. And so as we go to these nations and tell them, you should align yourself with the United States, you should be on the side of freedom, on the side of democracy, on the side of equality and liberty, the Soviet Union would follow us and say, and they lynch Negroes. As if to say that the democracy, the liberty, the freedom that they're promising in the United States, they killed their own people simply because of the color of their skin. And you are you to believe that democracy is what you want in your country when this is how they treat their own people in their country? And so now the race question in the United States became a national security concern. It became a foreign policy issue. And these new amb African ambassadors that we were hoping to gain influence over, to, to become friends with, to ally ourselves with, they were uh, watching how we treated Black Americans and were becoming uh, a, a bit concerned that maybe we weren't being true to our word. Maybe um, America was a place for hypocrisy and not for liberty. This is no good. John F. Kennedy, the president at the time, and his State Department decide that this can't stand. They talk to the governor of Maryland. They talk to state legislators in Maryland. They go, they send State Department officials to the diners on Route 40 to say, you're harming national security interests by treating African ambassadors this way. And after some time, eventually, the uh, diner owners begin to let these ambassadors eat at their diners. When African Americans, Black people who are citizens of the United States, began to hear that these uh, diners on Route 40 were now desegregated, they attempted to go eat and they were not welcomed. Only Black Africans ambassadors were welcome to dine at these places, often shuttled to a back room so that the, the white diners there didn't have to suffer the indignity of eating beside Black folks. But if you were a Black American, you were still not welcomed. Um, this is an incredible scenario here. Um, there was a, a Black newspaper in Baltimore called the Afro-American. They had three reporters who dressed up in tuxedos, rented a limousine, and pretended to be ambassadors from the fake nation of Goban. And they show up to a few diners and they're treated like royalty. They're ushered to private rooms, they're served, uh, they take pictures, and then they take these you know, tuxedos and, and shed their fake credentials and get rid of the limousine and show up later just as regular old reporters from a newspaper in Baltimore as Black Americans, and they're not served. And they print this story to show how ridiculous it is that, um, that if they were Africans, they would be treated um, as equals, but, if, but as Black Americans, they were not. The point that this entire story tries to communicate is that the nation, our nation state, the, the, the geopolitical entity we call the United States is governed by its interests, not by some absolute sense of right or wrong, of good or bad, of, of some, some compass that's unwavering uh, in terms of morality or principle, but that nations do what it is in their interest to do. And in this situation, it was in the nation's interest to make those black African ambassadors feel like they were treated as equals and it was not in the nation's interest at the time to extend that equal treatment to their own black people who had fought in World War II, in Korea, in World War I, and in every single combat endeavor, every single war the United States has ever embarked upon. Freedom, equality did not reach those black citizens, but it did reach the black ambassadors because it was in the nation's interest to do so in order to combat the influence of, Soviet, of the Soviet Union and win the Cold War. This is, is, this is not new. When our nation was created, it was created on the idea of, uh, of equality, that all of us are created equal, that we have these uh, unalienable rights among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that government derives its just power from the consent of the governed. And at the same time, we created this country, the first country ever created on the basis of a set of values and ideals we also allowed the institution of slavery to stay in place. And the reason they, the, the framers of the constitution did that is not because all of them hated black people. The reason they didn't allow women to vote is not because they hated women. Uh, the reason they, they uh, dispossessed Native Americans of, of their land is not because they you know, hated in their hearts Native Americans. It was because they recognized that if they wanted this union to be formed and come together, that they had to sacrifice some things of moral and principle, uh, some things that may have gone against some of their morality and principles in order to create the union that they felt was more important 
at the time. And so they sacrificed the lives of many people. They essentially traded the formation of our country for the perseverance of the institution of slavery. 90 years later, they took the exact opposite stance. Um, the next generation of Americans had come along and some states had seceded from the union um, over a, a set of issues. Most, uh, the, one of the biggest issues of course was the issue of slavery. And then the United States decided the only way our nation can come together and endure is if we get rid of slavery. Um, so nothing got more horrible or more terrible about slavery between 1776 when we declared our independence and 1860 when at the uh, at the beginning of the Civil War. But at our independence, at our founding, we decided to allow slavery to stand in order to create the union. And 90 years later, we decided to allow that that slavery had to go in order to bring the union back together and allow it to endure. And the only thing that changed in those intervening years was that it was in the nation's interest at our founding to keep slavery in place. And it, it was in the nation's interest in the Civil War to get rid of slavery in order to reunify the country. Okay, and so when we talk about things like the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement, this is not the result of a wave of moral epiphanies and a recognition of the human dignity of black folks that washed over a country that suddenly said, maybe we should allow these people to vote and maybe we should allow these people to live where they'd like and to, to be paid fair wages and to have access to the rights and privileges of citizenship. Instead, what happened in, in my view is that our brand around the world was being harmed because we were trying to convince the world that democracy was the best way forward. And we were not living in a way that respected the principles upon which the country was founded. This book, is about the idea that if we want to finally eradicate racism and to, even if, if, I don't even know if that's possible, but if we want to at least reduce its effects and, and live more closely to the principles we profess of, of justice and, and equality and liberty, that the way to do so is not to make the moral demand of our government to recognize the humanity and dignity of, of each one of us, no matter our race or ethnicity or gender or, or religion, et cetera, but the way to do this is to show that it's in the nation's interest to deliver these rights and privileges to us, no matter our gender, no matter our race or ethnicity, or, or again, nation of origin, et cetera. This can feel a little icky. Uh, this can feel like I, I have to tell the nation why they should care that I'm being treated poorly in this country. I have to convince the nation that they should care that I'm not being delivered the full rights and privileges of citizenship, citizenship that, that I'm not being extended the equal protection of the law that the 14th Amendment guarantees. Why do I have to convince the nation to deliver this to me when it's in our constitution? And it's because nation states are amoral, They're not, not immoral, they are amoral. They're not sentient beings. They have interests, not a moral compass. Certainly the people in a country have a moral compass and, and compel the nation to do the, the things they would hope it to do, the, the hope that it will do or the things they want it to do. But the way that that movement happens is often by showing how our moral demands align to the nation's interests. And when we can do that, then we can push the nation forward and compel it to be a better version of itself. This book is hopeful. This book is optimistic. This book leads with patriotism and faith in our country and a belief in our and the promise of America and our inherent equality and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and democracy that respects all of us and in uh, a, a system where government works for the people and not the other way around. But it also recognizes that structural racism is real in this country. And that if we don't reckon with structural racism, we cannot ever realize equality. We cannot ever finally achieve a land of, of justice and, and liberty. I'll say one more set of things and then, and then maybe we can move to um, some, some questions or conversation here. There's a, a set of so here's here's the broad thesis of the book. Um, you know the the idea here, as I've just explained it, is that if we want to make our nation live more closely to live up to its principles, then we have to show how our moral demands of our country align with the nation's interests. Okay, so the the thesis of the book is that racism is not just some inconvenience that we've drugged from history to the present. Uh, to, to the present. Uh, racism, racism is not just how people feel in their hearts about other groups. Um, it's not about hatred 
Certainly those things exist. But the racism that I'm talking about is the kind of racism that results from public policy, uh, where we have systems and structures in place that two people, one black and one white, with the same amount of education, growing up in the same economic status, working just as hard, don't reap the same rewards from our country because of how our country has been structured to advantage some over others. And so my argument is that structural racism is not an inconvenience, it's actually a threat to the American idea. The promise of America is that we're all created equal, and we have these unalienable rights, and that government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Nothing about what I've just said, that promise, is compatible with racial inequality. Nothing about that promise is compatible with structural racism. So either we do our best to eradicate structural racism, to mitigate its effects, or we have to acknowledge that our commitment to these ideals are only skin deep or only superficial. These two things cannot coexist. The promise of America can't live side by side with racism and be comfortable. So when at any one point in time where one level, one side is surging, the other side necessarily recedes. And we want the, the promise of America to come forward and not the other way around. The second argument that this, the, the book, the sort of the broad part of this thesis is that the only way to overcome the effects of racism on our country is for people across uh, difference, racial difference, ethnic difference, and et cetera, to come together and demand of the nation state and, and show the nation state that it's in its interest to reduce the presence of racism in our public policy, in our governmental structures. And the third part of this argument is that all of the people that have been left out of democracy at some point in this country, women didn't get the right to vote until 1920. If you are the de descendant of a white immigrant, you were left out of democracy and discriminated against for, for many, many de decades. Um, if you're a Native American, if you were a, a descendant from a, an enslaved black person, you have been excluded from this country's democracy at some point and often for a long time. Any group that has this experience has battled their way into democracy through faith in the promise and their own energies. And so this book argues uh, specifically from the black American experience that if we look at how black folks have gone from slavery to Jim Crow to today, that there are attributes of the solidarity to be found within black America that could be adopted nationally that could help us create a multiracial solidarity to compel the country to, to be a better version of itself. Not that black folks exclusively hold the answer, but that um, we are, we are a, a, a segment of the population that has a specific set of attributes that the nation would be wise to adopt. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there. I have kind of said a lot of things there and we can dive into some of the, these ideas and the ideas that surround them. But um, it's, it's good to see you, Sheed, and uh, I look forward yeah. to our conversation here. All right, yeah, I appreciate your overview, Ted. Uh, your, your book is remarkable in that it presents, a, it presents an optimistic, a progressive, I would say opportunity to understand how our, as you say in your book, our social contract mm -hmm. is a tool for us to make progress. And we have examples in our history of how we use the United States and the constitution and its laws to our advantage. But if we leave it to its own vices, then it's going to do what it needs to do. It's going to live how it's been set up because it's not sentient. And so one of the other topics that I guess I gleaned from your piece is the fact that structural racism is here, whether it's black or white or brown or gender based, you know, the suffrage movement and the women's right to vote. Those elements of our society can stay if the United States says this union is good. Unless we argue that these things need to change and there's an influence that's being detrimentally impacted, then we can't move that needle. And so I wanted you to expand on that concept is, that you mentioned in your book about the individual, that superlative citizenship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And because I see that as uh, one of the ways we as citizens can move the needle. And I think it harkens back to the influence from your grandparents. Yeah. 
Yeah, so superlative citizenship is one of the ideas I, I name in the book and then describe as the, the it's sort of a, a political strategy where folks who are not treated as full, real, true Americans overperform their duties as citizens in order to expose the nation for not living up to its end of the, the bargain, its end of the social contract. The social contract is an unspoken agreement between citizen and nation. And the, the contract basically says, citizens, in order to live here, you have some duties. You gotta pay taxes. You have to serve in the military or on duty, jury duty when called upon. You have to obey the laws and, and the orders of the government. And you know all of, these, all of these sort of duties of citizenship. And in return, we're going to provide you security and stability and opportunity and prosperity. And in the United States, that also means we're going to treat you as if you are equal. We're going to ensure that the rights and privileges of citizenship are available to you, no matter the condition of your birth, of your birth or, or your, your race or ethnicity. What happens is the state often doesn't live up to its end of the bargain. We know mm. from how they've treated women, how they've treated Native Americans, immigrants, right. black folks, et cetera, they've often fallen short. What superlative citizenship does is it when people that belong to the group that are being excluded from inclusion in our democracy, mm. that are not allowed to taste liberty and equality, when those folks do all of the duties of citizenship anyway, and not only do those duties of citizenship, but overperform those duties, as a, as a way of showing that they're worthy of citizenship, it exposes the hypocrisy of the nation state. And that hypocrisy mm. challenges a state's values and ideals and its sense of itself, its identity. Right. And when a nation state's identity is challenged, they're often compelled to try to close that gap of hypocrisy. And so when we look at uh, enslaved Black folks that ran away from plantations to fight in the Revolutionary War and then right. were returned to slavery after the war was won, same thing in the War of 1812 or in, in uh, fighting in the, the Civil War or the War of 1898 or the World War I, II, Korea, et cetera, and still having to come back and face Jim Crow, these right. are folks that were willing to die for democracy, give their life for the United States, only to come home and face, be treated like a third-class citizen in the very country that they were willing to give their life for. While, while this kind of strategy of exposing the gap is, is uh, a long-term incremental kind of strategy, it works. And we know this because of uh, the, the series of results that we saw from the judiciary, the executive branch, and the legislative branch, in particular between 1948 and 1968, that it began to extend more of America to Black folks. That was because of the kind of superlative citizenship that had been on display, in, especially during world wars and during a Great Depression and the industrial area era. So this, this is a strategy meant to show right. the nation that they're not living up to the end of the bargain and challenge them to prove the nation, to prove that it actually believes in the principles it espouses. And over time, um, those who are committed to such a strategy often uh, do compel the nation to make to, to, to make amends or to sort of close the gap and live up to right. its promise just a little bit more than it did before. Yeah, because African-Americans, you know, we have a history of making the case. And one of the avenues is personal to you, and that's the military, military mm -hmm. service, you know, the American Revolution, uh, the argument for from Frederick Douglass and the Civil War, but more specifically, uh, the Rough Riders, the USCT and the War for Independence, the Spanish-American War in 1890s, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that relationship. So that argument for uh, military activity, how do you see that as a case for uh, either superlative citizenship or, I guess, overcoming, as the theme we're talking about, overcoming that a uh, gap between the social contract and protecting us. You know, we are helping you protect us. We're right. showing that we're going to serve even though we can't lead our own troops until, you know, the, the Korean War. But we're going to show that we can be progressive. We can put our life on the line and help this country move forward. We're going to love this country, even mm -hmm. though the country is not fully loving us back. Mm -hmm. You know, so that, that yeah, if you can speak to that, point of military service. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's it's a, it hits on a few things. 
So, so one is, it, it, it is a remarkable, so after 9-11, um, George Bush, as he's trying to, to get the country to put its fear aside and sort of gather itself for the war that's coming, he acknowledges that one of the greatest forms of patriotism in this country are people who are who serve in the military. And that's not a new idea. That, that has been the case since our inception. I mean, it's a reason. There is a reason that George Washington was our first president. Um, it wasn't because he was super intelligent or more intelligent than everyone else around him, of the, the other right. framers. It was because of his military... Uh, presence, his sort of his his military achievements, the bravery he shown he right. showed, and the leadership he showed on the battlefield. So we've long been a nation that treasures military service, and Black folks know that from the revolutionary way forward. Exactly. That the best way to show that you're committed to this American project is to be willing to die for it, to be willing to bleed for it, and we have. And sometimes folks did that, and then they returned to their homes after their service was over and they were lynched, some of them in uniform. The story of Isaac Woodard, this is a man who was blinded by sheriffs at a bus stop Whoa. on his way back from World War II, returning home to his, his family, uh, beaten because he wasn't sufficiently you know, def deferent to the bus driver uh, as, a, as a black man. Uh, and so, so military service has always been a way to stake one's claim on belonging in a country. And because of that, when atrocities happen to military people, it often moved those in leadership to say, this is not sustainable. This is not something we can, we can uh, excuse. And, and frankly, when the military was desegregated by executive order in 1948, uh, President Truman, partly one of the reasons he did this was because he was shown, told stories about military members, black men who were returning from war, who were lynched in the uniforms. The second thing though it does is if you look at the psychological operations that Germany, Italy, and Japan, Korea, North Vietnam were using during war, we were still fighting in very segregated units, especially in World War I, II, and Korea. And what would happen is these folks would drop leaflets, you know, propaganda yes. over black mm -hmm. troops saying, why are you over here fighting us? when your people are back home being killed, who's protecting them while you're over here fighting us? Exactly. And then they would drop leaflets over white troops and say, while y'all are over here fighting us, black men are back home beating and, and assaulting your wives. Why would you ever leave your women unattended and come over here to fight this war when this is happening back home? So racism became a national security threat. It became a, a, a weapon that other nations use to try to divide us. And if you look right. at the only thing that's ever broken this nation in two, that literally broke us in two between the United States and the Confederacy, it was the question of the status of black people in this country. It was an issue of racism. And so that is how powerful racism is. If you look at the 2016 election, it was a lot, of, it was Russia, frankly, using propaganda to stoke racial tensions in the United States, telling white viewers, voters through Facebook ads, et cetera, those Black Lives Matter people, they now have guns. You should be scared. And then showing ads to Black audiences saying, it doesn't matter if you vote, those white folks are going to do whatever they want to anyway. If, if we do not address the issue of racism in our country, we leave ourselves vulnerable to other nations exploiting it. And we don't appreciate the sacrifices of those folks here who are willing to do everything it takes. And I'll say one, you know, five more seconds on this. If we look at race and ra racial ethnic representation in the military today, there is only one race that's overrepresented in the military where there are a higher percentage of the military than they are in the country. And that is black mm -hmm. Americans. White Americans are about equally represented. Hispanic okay. Americans about equally represented. Asian Americans, Native Americans underrepresented. Black Americans are overrepresented. We're 12% of the country, but 16, 17% of the people who serve in the armed forces. So that is a kind of patriotism that is uh, extremely powerful that we've leveraged over time. That's fascinating. You know, so historically, there's a parallel with um, military activity. You know, it's Civil War, you have World War I, and you have the Vietnam War, and you have this high percentage of African Americans fighting for the country or for a cause, for something that is supposed to either unify or make progress or communicate that product we're talking about of democracy, even though we're in a democratic republic, we can talk about that later, but parallel to each of these eras and African-American citizenship and confidence 
and the understanding of promise that you talk about mm. in your book, you also have parallel the rise, the three ways of the Ku Klux Klan. So yeah. that, you know, that backlash of American pro- African-American progress speaks again to one of your points about who is responsible for racism in America. Is it an individual issue among the people or is racism a crime of the state? Mm. You know, the social contract, you know, and and that was one of the points that was really compelling to me uh, as I read it was that, you know, racism exists, you know, uh, uh, whether it's ignorance or just not understanding the times or you you, 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 it's a part of your family or you're not exposed, but who is responsible with that propaganda machine? Who is responsible for correcting and supporting our ability to overcome racism? Is it the government and the social contract or is it the individual? If you can speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. So you're right. One of the, the core arguments in the book is that racism is not some issue that white folks and black folks need to work out by, you know, sitting around a campfire singing kumbaya. <laughs> but that but racism is a crime of the state that that public policy, the nation, the government has to take the steps to ensure that there is equal protection of the law and that we don't have systems that produce racial inequality, um, either on right. purpose or, or just through a lack of intervention. Uh, so, look. It, there's the way I think about this is uh, we can't compel the nation to be a better version of itself by turning by you know people turning against one another and pointing at each other for all the blame uh, you know blaming them for all the things that uh, that that have happened to them. Um, if we if we think about racism structurally, it's it, you know there's a, a news article that came out last week that said that white Americans that made between zero and $65,000 were more likely to get their homes refinanced, to be approved for refinance than black Americans that made between 68,000 and 120,000. Now that doesn't mean that oh. there are like the, all the bank loan officers and the bank presidents and the realtors that they all hate black people. It just means that the way our system is structured, that black folks is, are seen as a, a higher financial risk and therefore less people are willing to lend money. And if they do, it's often at higher interest rates that again, dig into some of some of, some of these issues. Um, so uh, there's a point that I want to make that keeps that that's that's leaving me here. But you, it, you, were, you were mentioning that that whole redlining piece in the, the mortgage system that not can't necessarily be related to uh, racism, but structurally, economically, there are elements that uh, reveal a racial pattern. And it's up to us to argue for that change because the system will not change unless it sees a value. We have to communicate, not you're doing me wrong. Uh, as a matter of fact, you had a quote in your book from James Baldwin mm-hmm. and speaking to the fact that I love this country more than any other country. And that gives me the right to be critical and right. love this country at the same time. And I think right. that's what we're speaking to. That's right. Right. Yeah, right. So, you know, this this idea that racism is a crime of the state, it, it is, is born of how we got to this place uh, at this point in the first place. When um, our country was first founded, in fact, centuries before it was founded, um, and, and the decision was made that, that free labor needed to be located somewhere in order to make this fertile agrar- you know, agrarian economy prosper. Right. And mm-hmm. they decided to enslave Black folks after a, an attempt at enslave, enslaving Native Americans. It wasn't that the folks who made this decision said, we hate Black people, so let's go enslave them. What they they made a decision based on their interests. We have this land that needs farming, and if we were to pay everyone a fair wage for the farming of this land, the economy is not going to move. We have to be able to make large margins until we can get this land sort of uh, you know seeded and sowed and, and yeah. etc. And so they came up with a system that was racist, that they, they basically found free labor and black folks and then put them in the system. But in order to justify that enslavement, they had to come up with racist ideas. So I know where this country founded on the idea that we're all created equal and that we have these unalienable rights, but right. these folks that we brought from Africa, they're not as smart as us. They're not, you know, but they're biologically inferior, they're culturally inferior. So slavery is actually good for them because right. if not for us, 
they would be in the backwater somewhere, you know, you know, and, and would be less civilized. And initially, the idea was we have to enslave them because they're not Christian. And so we have to yeah, teach them right. the ways of our religion in order to civilize them. And so the, the point here, though, is that the, I, the racist ideas didn't come from people's hearts. They were a justification that resulted from bad racist policy. And mm. then once we changed the policy, when we got rid of slavery, when we got rid of like Jim Crow, et cetera, the racist ideas are harder to get rid of. And right. the other part of this is the policies that we came up with, like you mentioned, redlining and these other ways of trying to make it in America, they right. were formed at a time where racial inequality, where racial segregation was acceptable. And then when we decided that those things were no longer acceptable, we didn't go back and undo the damage from those previous decades of bad policy. And to your point about the KKK, the backlash, racist ideas outlived the racist policies that created them. And now we find ourselves in this uh, weird quandary where we think we've taken the steps to undo bad policy by passing new laws, but we haven't done enough to undo the damage resulting from those bad policies or to counter the racist ideas that uh, resulted from them. Yeah, you know, um when citizens argue about racism, we are letting our government off the hook. Yes. You know, we are saying we are taking responsibility for this ill and you go work on something else. We have this, which we don't have this. We have <laughs> centuries of not having this and perpetuating things after the, the government has said, hey, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, you know, behave properly. Eventually you get suffrage and the 19th Amendment, you know, behave properly, use your right to vote. And, you know, but you, you have this paternalistic view of the government, but actually you're saying there's power on both sides. Even after the agrarian economy issue of, of the post civil war atmosphere and the opportunity mm. to rise, you know, you have individuals taking advantage of a system to put in peonage, mm. cycles of debt that go on and on the economic slavery. And we have the right, we have the responsibility to speak, but hold our government ac uh, accountable for their role in this. And so you had another uh, concept in your book that I really liked that also flips the script, you know, uh, civic religion, mm, you know, mm -hmm. civil religion and the understanding, understanding of nationalism and where it fits in that. If you could speak to civil religion. Yeah. Um, so I'll start here. Look, I'm from North Carolina originally. And if you go to the mountains of North Carolina and Appalachia, you'll find poor communities full of white Americans, white North Carolinians, who have school systems that are not doing what they're supposed to do, that are that are right. not serving the students because they're not resourced or, or whatever. And then if you go to parts of Charlotte or Greensboro or where I'm from in Raleigh, you'll find black kids in segregated communities being served by schools that aren't doing what they're supposed to do, that are not creating students that are ready for, you know, a, you know, a good college education right. or, or jobs in America. And then instead of the, the way that the nation, uh, the, in, in this case, the state, the way that they can continue under delivering to white kids in Appalachia and black kids in Southeast Raleigh is by saying the reason you in Appalachia or you in Southeast Raleigh don't have the schools you want is because of this reason. Those people over there, these immigrants, um, you know, all of these expenses government right. have. And so if you want the government that you think you deserve, you need to go fix the, the you know, you need to, we, we need to find a way to make sure that those people who are, or who are um, drags on the system are dealt with right. properly. And then this, and, and by doing this, they turn us against one another. And now ah. black folks are looking at white folks, white folks are right. looking at immigrants, immigrants are looking at, at black folks like, you are the reason why I don't have the country that I want. And as long as we're bickering in that way, the state doesn't have to deliver anything to any of us. And they Not can continue to do what's in their interest to do, which is usually an economic um, sort of prosperity thing for a very select few. So the argument about civil religion says, look, in our country, the only thing that unites all 330 million of us of different races, ethnicities, religions, right. customs, cultures, et cetera, is a belief in the promise in mm. equality liberty, democracy, nothing else unites us. It's not our religion, it's not our race, it's not, nothing else connects us except these ideals. 
And a civil religion says that when a people can find this common belief that unites them right. in the same way that Christianity, you could be very different races, different regions, but your a, a, the belief in the Christian tenets unites folks or in Islam or in Judaism or, or other religions, that there is a civil religion in America. And a civil religion doesn't mean that Christianity is now the state religion. A civil right, religion exactly. means that there is a religious quality to being a, an American, to, to expressing civic belonging. Most religions have a God or gods. Um, in the civil religion, we have a pantheon here in America. Just go to, I live in Northern Virginia. You go to the mall in DC, the pantheon is there. Monuments to Jefferson and Washington mm -hmm. and Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Most religions have rituals communion, the Hajj, Seder, et cetera, we have uh, rituals here in the United States. We've got the Pledge of Allegiance. We've got right. the, you know, the national anthem. Most religions have symbols, whether it's the Star of David or the Crescent Moon in Islam or the cross in, in Christianity. In America, we've got the flag. We've got the Statue mm -hmm. of Liberty. We've got the, the bald eagle. And most religions have observances, Christmas and, and um, you know, Rosh Hashanah and <laughs> and uh, in Ramadan. And here yes. we've got Independence Day and Memorial Day and Veterans Day. So we've got all of the tenets of a religion. But the, instead of having this deity that we pray to in, in a civil religion, we have principles that we hope mm -hmm. will govern the way we interact with one another and the way we structure our country. And if those principles aren't enough to unite us, if liberty is not enough to bring us together, democracy is not enough to bring us together, then we will see one another as threats to each other. And we can right. never be the e pluribus unum America where out of many one come together because mm -hmm. I'm looking at white folks saying, why are you stopping me from realizing the American dream? And they're looking at me saying, why are you not pulling your fair share and working harder to realize just like my realize you know the promise of America like my grandparents did and why are immigrants not you know doing the taking the steps necessary to become citizens and why are uh, you know Native Americans so um you, you know right. connected to their reservations instead of wanting to become part of the larger America well all we do is bicker about who gets what in America instead of recognizing that we we should be believing in the same things and ultimately working to the same towards the same goals amazing. And, and, and it's, it's, it's right there. And you, you mentioned two concepts that, uh, unfortunately, people approach it in a synonymous manner. American promise versus the American dream, mm. right? And you talk about that in your book. And there's a delineation of exactly what that means. There's opportunity and there's value, right? If you can speak to that. Yeah. So the, the American dream is about social mobility. It's about mm -hmm. economics. It's about, you know, having the white picket fence and the, 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 the two car garage house and, the, you know, the family with two and a half kids like that's the American dream. Concisely put, the American dream is a country where you do better than your parents did where their sacrifices help you yeah. to do better than they did, make more money than, than they did, uh, have more opportunity than they did. The American promise is not connected to the economy at all. The promise is life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. The promise is equality. The promise is ensuring our democracy is inclusive and that it works for all of us. You can have the dream and not have the promise. Lots of people got rich before the Civil War. Lots of people got rich during Jim Crow. Lots of people are, are getting rich today. And that doesn't mean that the American dream, that, that the it's spreading of the American dream means that more people are have access to the promise. Um, and frankly, today, one of the stats I show in the book is that social mobility is actually easier in Canada today than it is in the United States, which would be another way of saying that the American dream is more tangible in Canada. Right than it is in the United States. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing. The promise is something else. And you sort of hinted at this in your question. It's about how we value one another, not our economic value, but our, our, the, our value as people. Do you value someone? If, if we were to do, one of the controversial topics is reparations these days. And the, the argument is there's such a wealth gap, such an income gap between black and white right. Americans resulting from slavery and Jim Crow, mm -hmm. that if we do reparations, um, and, and pay out those descendants of formerly enslaved folks will close those wealth and, and income gaps. And now people will be able to, to touch equality more because they'll have the American dream. And what I say is, if you don't value black folks, 
you can distribute $10 trillion to Black folks and reparations tomorrow, and the day after that, there will be the most destructive but creative financial vehicles to get that wealth out of Black people's hands and back to, to where it came from. Because right. there's no, the, the, the question is in the value. When, when it comes to voting, we passed the 15th Amendment that extended voting to at least Black men at the time. We passed the Voting Rights Act of 65, and yet we're still having questions and fights about voting rights today in 2022 right. because the laws weren't sufficient because we the, the value, uh, the way we value one another isn't there. So until we close that value gap, um, and until we realize that the promise is the thing that should be governing how we interact with each other and not the dream exclusively, then... Um, we will never become the more perfect union, that we will always fall a little bit short of uh, of who we profess to be. All right. Uh, we, we've had three significant errors where there was literature that spoke to a post-racial society, mm. you know, and reconstruction. You had senators and mayors and all black cities economic independence, and we saw that ebb and flow. We saw some of that fall. We had the 70s where African-Americans were going back to the voting box and putting African-Americans in uh, political positions. So we, you know, we had that way, right? And now, and more recently, we, we've had an African-American president, yeah. right? And so you heard that theme again. Finally, we have a post-racist society. And again, we are talking about what we see, but the obligation and the activity still rests with the Republic, you know? And so the product that we're selling is not always the democracy. It is how you vote, how you represent and how you navigate this democratic Republic, which sometimes I don't think the citizenry realize that we may not be in a full 100% democracy but that's right. what we sell right yeah it's um so you know post racial is is something um we we hear even today um the last week or so when uh the supreme court confirmation hearings were happening around uh, for judge kataji brown jackson to be on the supreme court right in the lead up to it, and even last week, we heard lots of folks referring to Dr. King and saying, you know, he wanted a colorblind society. He wanted a world, a nation where people are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And one of the arguments I make in the book is that the fulfillment of the American promise isn't post-racial. It's not colorblind. Right. It's actually color conscious. The, the beauty <laughs> of this thing we're trying right. to build is that we don't have to pretend like race doesn't exist so that we can all just be American and now we can get along because we've we've shed our other identities. Right. The beauty and of it is- you said we exists, should. Right, exactly. You said we should. Right, right, right. And so, so King, when he said he didn't want his kids to be judged by the color of their skin, he didn't say that he didn't want their skin to have color. He still right. wanted their, his kids to be black. He just didn't want them judged differently because they were black. The exactly. beauty of America, the fulfillment of the promise is when his kids can be black and be treated equally. Not when his kids can be whitewashed and race doesn't matter anymore. And so we don't have to talk about it. The black American experience is different from the Irish American experience, the German American experience, the Hispanic, you know, whether it's, you know, Guatemala or Puerto Rico or Cuba, like we have lots of, of experiences, historical experiences in this country. And the right. beauty of what we're building here is that we don't have to get rid of our history in order to mm. come together and share a national identity. So I, I don't believe the fulfillment of America is a post-racial colorblind meritocracy. I believe the fulfillment of America is when we get to bring our full identities. I get to be a black American veteran man and mm -hmm. American and my race doesn't detract from my Americanness. And that if a, a new family who just comes over from say Haiti, uh, they also get to be fully American exactly. because they've, you know, they've become citizens and they believe in the principles of, of our country. And they're not lesser Americans simply because of where they were born. No nation has ever done this. We're trying to pull something off that no nation in the history of this earth has ever accomplished. Right. We're in the position to be able to finally make it true. And the way to make it true isn't to ignore the thing that gives us our uniqueness, our beauty. The only way it will be true is if we ex embrace and accept one another 
in spite of our differences, maybe even because of our differences, and recognize that the idea of America, the, the, the promise of America, liberty is big enough for all of us. Equality is big enough for all of us. Democracy can include all, all of right. us. We don't have to ration it off. And, uh, and until we get to that point, then I, you know, we, we'll never fulfill the, what the potential of this country uh, could be. You know, one of, we are, we're in Florida, right? And this is a, one of the more you, I've lived in a few different states, but this state is so rich in its diversity. Mm. You have African-Americans, you have Cuban-Americans, the, you have German-Americans, the, the, the cuisine, mm. the different parts. If you're in North Florida and you travel to South Florida, you're probably looking at a different state, right? Mm. And you're still in Florida. We even have two time zones. So wouldn't it be nice if it's okay to be who you are, whether that's, you know, gender right platform, African-American right platform, or German right, German-American right platform. You know, there is a need to be full of color, actually. You know, the, the color consciousness needs to be in the policy. Uh, it, uh, one of the questions that came up was that we're having a national conversation about race mm -hmm. in America, right? But we're only talking to ourselves, mm -hmm. right? You know, you and I, African-American, same fraternity, had to throw that right. in, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we know each other, we have a common ground, but shouldn't it be more of a conversation between people of diverse cultures? You know, Florida Humanities, you know, we define humanities, not just history, it's philosophy, mm. literature, storytelling. And we understand that we have to know our neighbor and our neighbor is going to be different. So shouldn't we be having a conversation with somebody that's racially or politically different from ourselves? Yeah, 100 percent. Absolutely. You hit it on the head. I, I think the last numbers I saw were that uh, something like 80 percent of black American social circles and almost 90 percent of white American social circles are filled with people who look just like them. Not yeah. only look like them, but make the same kind of money they do, make the you know <laughs> go to the same church right. as they do, um, have the same level of education. So people are talking about race in America, but like you said, black folk we're talking about it at the barbershop. White folks are talking about it, you know, we're, we're in in uh, wherever you know the HOA or or the, the, their kids soccer, you know, like we're we're having these conversations, but right. we're not talking across difference. And part of the reason is because, one, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be OK with being vulnerable to have oh. real conversations about race when you're the minority in the room. The other part of it is that you have to actually know someone you can have a conversation with. You know, and so yeah. it'd be easy to say, just go talk to more black folks if, you know, tell white folks, go talk to more black folks. But if they don't know any who they who they who they trust or can be vulnerable with or that you can have a conversation with, it ain't enough. Uh, the other thing is there's like a a barrier to these conversations because of language. If you, if I were to try to talk to someone about say transgender athletes, and mm. I don't know the language of, of that community, if I don't know that calling a transgender woman a man is offensive, then it's, I don't wanna have that conversation because I'm there trying to learn and I say one wrong thing and it's, you don't, you know, you're, you're, right. uh, you're, you're discriminatory, you're a bigot, you're prejudiced, you're uninformed, you're ignorant. And who wants to be put in that situation where you arrive in good faith and now you're called, you know, you're, uh, right. uh, something like if I've, I've had white conservatives who've read my book, I, I sent this to a few who um, read early copies and they would say, you know, I don't know why blacks do this or that. And I know in some rooms when, when you say blacks, mm. it's like, no, we're African-American. Right. You know, we're not, I'm not a color. And, and it's that the fear of being reprimanded for simply mm -hmm. wanting to engage earnestly is a huge barrier. And so in order to have these conversations, we have to meet people and engage with people and interact with them across difference. Two, we have to be okay with being vulnerable in mm. these situations. And we have to seek these situations out. And three, we have to extend grace to those who come with good hearts, just wanting to know more and not expect them to uh, speak in our language, adhere to our worldview and, and see uh, you know, d disagreement as being grounds for shutting the conversation down. Easy for me to say, 
very, very difficult for folks to do. Right, right. That's what's required uh, of uh, to, to realize our country. And, you know, the last bit I'll say is that is what the military gave me. Mm. I, I was able to, I was on deployments with white guys from Iowa, with Hispanic dudes from LA, with, you know, you know Asian American women from, from San Francisco. And we were to, we talked together. We got to know one another by virtue of our military service to the country. And if we can create more of those kinds of contacts, then we've got a better shot at having a real national conversation about race in this country instead of um, the very narrow and um, echo chamber versions of, of the conversations we're presently having. Yeah, I would say something that along those lines that I participated in that was very innovative. I would remind our, our viewers that Florida Humanities provides grants to nonprofits and organizations that uh, facilitate conversations uh, like these, these difficult, sensitive topics, right? Mm -hmm. One of our grantees uh, is in Tallahassee, Goodwood Gardens, Plantation of Gardens, right? And so you hear the, you hear the word there, plantation, okay? Okay, right. of course. And so I had an opportunity to talk with their docents and volunteers. And the, the, the reason they wanted to have a conversation with me was exactly what you just said. We recognize these are 30 white Americans, you know, they're 55 or older, and they're trying, they're volunteering, they're giving back, mm -hmm. right? And they anticipate African Americans coming to the museum, which that's difficult because you're actually walking on a plantation. But in doing so, we need to tell this story about the people who lived on this plantation and what they did. Yeah. So how do we do that without mm -hmm. hurting someone's feelings? They were OK asking me, do I say black? And in the early 20s, the 19th century, they used the word Negro. You know, right. so when do we say African-American? And so that that was very compelling. And, and mm -hmm. I, I really think that you really hit on something. We need to be comfortable asking that question. You know, how do I refer to Native Americans or indigenous peoples? You know, how do I have that conversation? But you have to be able to put yourself in a situation to be vulnerable. I really like that. That's a, yeah. that is a great takeaway. Yeah. And don't just, you know, ask the people you're talking about how they want to be referred. What we've seen a lot, at least I've seen a lot in reporting recently that Latin X is a term that Hispanic people have not actually said, please call us Latin X. You know, <laughs> you have you, you should ask them how do they want to be referred to right. and not just assume that the, the latest terminology in, in the newspaper or whatever is how everyone wants to be identified. But that requires you being vulnerable. But this is right. what the conversations take. And, and I want to say one thing quickly on the plantation example you gave. I think it's beautiful that um, these folks who are sort of the tour guides, et cetera, of the plantation right. want to diversify the people that come there and want to be inclusive, want to tell the full story. Like these, this is who lived in the house, but here's who lived in the little huts around the house. Here's what they did. Here's what their lives were like. And also not do so in a way to make people feel guilty. None of the white folks on these tours enslaved anybody. And none of the black folks on these tours right. were enslaved. And so we can talk about the institution of slavery and its implications. We can talk about the status of white folks, you know, in slavery and what that meant for generations afterwards in terms of like the, the you know, passing wealth on, et cetera, without demonizing each other. That's true. You know, again, if racism is a crime of the state, slavery is something that the nation did to all of us, some of us were harmed more than others, but all of us were harmed by this institution. And as we talk about this, instead of looking at white folks and say, y'all had it so good and now you owe me, or, or looking at black folks and say, you, you know, you should be so thankful that you're not enslaved like the people on this plantation were, this isn't a conversation, like the, what happened in 200 years ago is not something for us to work out on this tour. It is something for us all to learn about, recognize, mm -hmm. The, the progress from that point, recognize the damage that still lingers from that point, and then come together and say, if we both want this kind of, this America that we believe in, we're gonna have to recognize that damage was done and that the nation state, the, the government should should do what it's, what's required to make right. these things better without turning into enemies, without demonizing one another in the process. Again, right. easily said, but um, there are a lot of folks out there who make their money by turning us against one another, who win political office, 
who literally make their money by dividing the people. That's true. And uh, we, we've got to be resilient to that or we're going to lose this shot we have at, at creating a, a, a country that's even more beautiful than it is now. And we, we miss out on stories. And I'm ask a question. I'll ask a question here in a second. And we'll transition to another segment. Liz will come and bring some questions from the audience. But it, it, it touches on the missed opportunities. If, if Goodwood had not allowed... Uh, those docents to feel comfortable telling stories about African-Americans uh, that lived on that plantation, we would not hear about uh, one of the workers that became wealthy and started to work and vote in the community and potentially mm-hmm. owned a corner store, which you know is a critical part of some of our neighborhoods. And so that trans that transitions over into this point in your book. Uh, th- during the period of the 1940s, we're going to get back to the first point we talked about, 1940s and 1970s, uh, you listed, uh, you, you discussed some major players you felt were superlative citizens. And so if you can give us some examples of some of those who you feel, or an example of some of those individuals who were superlative citizens. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, the, I actually begin at the founding of the country w- with a, a man named Jehu Grant in 1776, who ran away from his plantation in Rhode Island to fight in the Revolutionary War. And the the, the, the slave man, the man who owned him, showed up at the army after he had been, you know, um, fighting for the nation's freedom, independence for 10 months and said, told the army, you have my property and I want it back. And the army turned him right back over. And uh, he ended up, you know, dying indigent and penniless and blind, oh. um, never receiving the pension for the, the the for his fighting in the Revolutionary War, because the nation said um, when he applied for the pension, they said that services rendered while a fugitive from your master are not recognized um, oh. in, in the in military service. Um, and so we could go forward. I mean, like all of the players from, especially in the 20th century, you know, yeah. the, the Martin Luther Kings and mm-hmm. the Constant Baker Motley's and the Thurgood Marshalls of the world. But also, you know, in 1948, Truman desegregated the military. In 1957, President Eisenhower, a Republican who wasn't, you know, a racial progressive, sent the 101st Airborne to Little Rock uh, High School in Little Mm -hmm. Rock, Arkansas, to forcibly desegregate that school, not because that was his personal preference, but because the Supreme Court said in Brown v. Board in 1954 that segregation, racial segregation in our public schools is no longer constitutional. Separate but equal is no longer constitutional. So the president executed, he, he, he basically enforced the Supreme Court's ruling, even though it wasn't his own, because he believed in the institutions in our country. He believed that when the Supreme Court says something, it needs to be enforced. And he used the power of the military, not just in Arkansas, but also the University of Mississippi, to compel the states to do what the nation had said. In 1964, we get the Civil Rights Act. 65, we get the Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act in 68. 20 years, two decades of solid progress by people who forced the the citizenry, the public, to adhere to a better version of ourselves by, by getting rid of separate but equal, not because they believed it personally, but because uh, they recognize that if we didn't live up to these values, we left ourselves open for uh, un- being undermined by other nations and, and essentially being hypocrites, which uh, prevents us from having the kind of influence we, we would like to have on the world right. uh, for national security purposes. So, again, this is one of those. Uh, this is, I think, the support of citizenship alone. We could probably take the hour right. just unpacking that idea, never mind the, the other five or six we've touched on already. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a beautiful idea and not something specific to black people. Again, women executed this. Um, immigrants have executed this. They, they've they proven their worthiness to be part of this project by demanding they be included and not waiting for it to be gifted to them from uh, from folks who who suddenly had a, an, an epiphany. Right. And you, 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 the point and about, you know, the Arkansas nine, I'm from Arkansas and yeah. uh, some of the history that comes after that, you know, you have this national presence comes and leaves and there's an aftermath. And one of the positive aftermaths of uh, what people saw as opportunity, there was a there was a wave of of individuals who felt, hey, I can contribute. I can invest in my community. And so there were a lot of, of graduates with master's uh, degrees teaching in these small rural communities. Mm-hmm. 
such as you know Helena or Forest City. This is in Arkansas, and it, it was a wave of trend across the South of individuals who had PhDs and masters teaching at the K through 12 level up until the 1970s when you had desegregation. That's another argument, whether it, you, you know what I'm talking about, whether it helped mm-hmm. or not. But but the question comes to mind, how do going forward, how should we invest our time? How should we invest our money in trying to move that needle? Where can we move the needle or how do we move the needle? And um, before I finish you know, you know, to the audience, I see when the stars begin to fall. I see your book as a tool for people mm. to to open their eyes on the role they have in this social contract. You know, you hear this concept of a social contract and you wonder, how can I participate? Where do I participate? And you give examples, you give Mm -hmm. themes and topics that can be easily digested. But back to the question, how can we move the needle? Where should we invest or where can we invest our time and our money? Right. Yeah, and I'll I'll do I'll be quick so we can sort of get through a number of questions. Right, um, the, yeah. um, so the you know whenever you write a book, usually the last chapter the publisher says you need to tell people like now that you've convinced them that this thing is real, what they can do about it, so they feel like they can walk away with some something to do. So I've got five things that I think are necessary for us to create a multiracial solidarity. And I I can run through the five, you know, it's deliberative democracy, civic education, national service, transformative leadership, and sort of democracy reform. But what these five things are really trying to do, it's two things. The first thing is create more opportunities for us to contact Americans, make contact relationships with Americans who are different from us. Okay. Um, A program of national service forces us to work with folks we didn't grow up with and learn more about one another so that we're resilient to those divisive racist appeals that folks with power often try to use to keep us divided and bickering instead of allowing us to come together to compel the government to do things. So uh, national service is one of those things, deliberative democracy is another one of those things. And even civic education, civic learning, uh, not just how many branches of government there are, do you know who your congressperson is, but we don't teach people how to be citizens. Mm -hmm. We teach people that it's important to vote. We teach people that, you know, there are three branches of government, but we don't teach a 40 year old, for example, how do you participate in this in this society in a way that is constructive in a way that is, um, you know, um, not just votes for president every four years, but is engaged at the local state level as well. Exactly. And so all of these things are meant to create more participation and create more connection. And then the other thing is that our systems, again, because this is an issue for the state to resolve, we have institutions that are not responsive to the will of the people. Mm. After George Floyd was murdered, the vast majority of Americans supported police reform to include the majority of Republicans in Congress and the majority of Democrats in Congress. And nothing got done because they bickered over this one point on qualified immunity. When you ask Americans how they feel about universal background checks for gun ownership, the majority of Americans and both Republicans and Democrats, white and black, Hispanic, et cetera, all say, yes, we want that. It hasn't happened because our government doesn't have to be responsive to us. Instead, all they have to do is tell, convince us those the other side doesn't like you they don't believe in what you believe in they're enemies of the state and so the number one job is to defeat them instead of uh recognizing where where what the people want the the last point i want to say on this is in this because it's florida specific just a couple of years ago floridian said we want people who were formerly incarcerated to be able to vote again Ah. and there was a state ballot that asked the people, not the government, but went directly to the people, what do y'all think? And 65% of people in Florida, white, black, I think every county but one said, yes, we want people who were formerly incarcerated, who served their time, Mm -hmm. who paid their debt to society to be able to vote again. And what did the state government in Florida do? They blocked those formerly incarcerated folks from being able to vote again through these administrative tricks around fines and fees, et cetera. The will, the express will of the people was ignored by the by, the elected folks in in the state of Florida, simply because they felt like it was in their political interest to do so, and so we are at a point now where our government is not being responsive to what we the people want. Right. And last I checked, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence says that our government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. We are the governed. The way we give our consent is by voting, and when we do that, and they ignore us. 
democracy is broken. All right. Not because we hate each other, mm. not because something's wrong with us, but because our system is uh, is incentivized to keep us divided instead of bringing us together to compel them to, to be responsive. Yeah, I, I'll say this point and we'll bring uh, Liz on. The, the government we live in is a democratic republic. That means that we vote and we relinquish a portion of our power in trust and belief that that individual we elected is going to deliver on elements of that promise or that platform that we voted for. And so if we ask that representative, that senator to walk down and walk up the hill and walk through the trenches and deliver on one of our gaps, right? And they don't do that, then we have an obligation to go back and make sure that they deliver, change some things, readdress. We can't let those mistakes and those missteps go unanswered. Mm. Hey, Liz. Hi there. Incredible conversation, gentlemen. <laughs> I have a two for question. Okay. Um, the first is if you could talk about the concept that you described in the book of civic friendship mm -hmm. and specifically also mentioning democratic strangers. And then the second question is it's been a very tumultuous time since your book was released. And I wondered if in that period of time, you have some specific reflections of what we've been going through. Yeah. Yeah. So look, we are, um, as I've said, we're in a nation of 330 plus million folks. It's impossible for us to feel connected to one another in a nation this big. Uh, all the way back to like Aristotle and Plato, they said, after you get bigger than a city, you really lose the connection to the people you share this, mm. this uh, society with. So that's why they love the city state, the city republic. So a nation uh, of, of over 330 million folks is very difficult to feel connected to one another. And so this is what folks have called democratic strangers, that we live in a democracy together, but we're really estranged from one another for all the reasons we've talked about. We roll in different circles based on our race, our class, our education level, et cetera. We have a very small circle of people that we're connected to. And then the other hundreds of millions of folks out there we don't feel a connection to except for the fact that they're also citizens who pay taxes right. and who vote etc the the problem is when you don't feel connected to folks then you have less of an interest that they get the same kind of america you're getting or they uh, that they mm. get more of the america that they should be getting given the the rights and privileges that the social contract affords and um because they're not getting it you it, it doesn't move you if you don't feel connected to them so the concept of civic friendship says you don't actually have to know all 330 million americans to right. feel connected to them but you do need to recognize that the only way you can get the fullness of the promise is when everyone else here gets some of that too. And that wow. sacrifice is what friendship is. And you know, me and you, she, we know about friendship in a, right. a, on exactly. a like, different level there, <laughs> but civic friendship is, is the, the being willing to sacrifice for someone else. And in the civic sense, it means be allowing them to be part of the same society, have the same rights and privileges, even if you're not connected to them. Um, so transitioning from democratic strangers to civic friendship is, um, is I, I think, central to trying to create solidarity across, uh, especially across racial and ethnic lines. So in terms of like, how do, how do I see this moment given all of that? I will say that my book was, in, in my original pitch, I wanted it to come out in the spring of 2020, mm. because I wanted it to be ahead of the presidential election. Um, and I wanted to sort of influence the country to be thinking about how to come together, even in this time of like very contentious presidential um, uh, electoral politics. And my publisher said, no one's going to be looking for a kumbaya book um, before a presidential election. They're gonna be at each other's throats. Wow. They're gonna want their side to win. After the election, after it's all said and done, people will be sick of it. And then they'll be looking for some inspiration to go forward. Oh. But what we, neither one of us knew is that George Floyd, when he was murdered on Memorial Day of 2020, that a summer of solidarity would be the thing that followed. Uh, yeah. Every day in this country, weeks on end, there were racial justice marches, marches against police abuse, marches for Black Lives Matter in every state in the union. There were Black Lives Matter racial justice marches in Idaho with no Black people there. <laughs> and so I At wish NASCAR. my book had dropped. 
And, and, right. Nice. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish my book dropped in that moment because I think people were ready for that the solidarity argument. Um, and then after the presidential election, it was contested. The the sides didn't agree. You know, some folks didn't don't believe who won and who did win. January 6th, there's this massive riot at the Capitol. Then there's a pandemic that causes us to go into our homes and not socialize with one another. The economy drops out. And all of the things that should have brought should have brought us together a pandemic, right. a bad economy, a government that's not working or at least not recognizing um, it's, it's uh, you know, the peaceful transfer of power in the way that we'd hoped didn't bring us together. It actually served as different axes for us to be divided. So um, that worries, worries me. And right. I think my I, I'm glad my book came out when it did, because I this is the moment I'm trying to speak to, to, to not allow these uh, differences to continue to divide us, but to find ways of, of coming together in spite of our differences. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if we get the lesson in the, the, the months and, and years ahead. But uh, I, I am a, I am a little worried about the moment we're in. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think that at an individual's core, even if you've been raised in an environment that is blind to some of the injustice, I think at the core, if you can, if, if the truth can be revealed in a way that meets you and how you speak in your language, as we talked about earlier, if I find a way to communicate you, with you, meet you where you are, then there's an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity for progress and healing, but at the least, an opportunity to understand. Right. right. So do you have another question, Nasheed? No, I, I, I wanted to... I want, I want to see if we could talk a little bit about uh, you know, your point we talked about earlier, Liz, on John McCain. We had a really good discussion uh, about mm. you know, his role, his uh, strength against you know, the truth to power. You made a, a good point there. Yeah, a, be- a beautiful part in the book. There were many weepy moments for me in your book, but one of them that was most powerful was when you talked about the night that John McCain conceded the presidency, yeah. say something mm. about that. Yeah, it's it's something. Um, and so, you know, the the book is Theodore R. Johnson. That's that's my name, and but that R stands for Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt Johnson the third is my my full name. I was named after my grandfather, who was named after President Teddy Roosevelt, um, after Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the White House. The first time ever in history, a president invited a black man to dine at the White House with the first family. A lot of people were not happy with that because when you dine with someone, you, it suggests that you're equals. But um, a lot of very uh, you know poor black sharecroppers in the South saw that moment as maybe a symbol that racial equality was on the horizon. And my, my great grandparents named my, my grandfather that, and it's been passed on to me. This is actually a story that John McCain tells in his concession speech. Um, the night he loses to Barack Obama, Barack Obama becomes the first black president. And he says this moment is historic in the same way that it was when President Roosevelt invited Booker T. Washington to the oh. White House. And so he sort of causes, he asked the nation to just take a moment and recognize the historical nation, the historical nature of this moment. And then he says, and the, the, the special meaning it has for, for African-Americans in America today. Um, he says two other things that are important. One is that he said, look, me and Barack Obama disagree on a lot of things, but I can say that he is a fellow American and that relationship means more to me than anything else. And he doesn't just say it. He says, and and I mean that he sort of reiterates the point Mm. right there in the moment. I mean it when I say that he is a fellow American. And to say he was an American, this is when people were saying that he was secretly born in Kenya, mm. that he you know, was a Muslim socialist that was coming to undo America. He would, people at his campaigns were saying that Barack Obama's a Muslim, he wasn't born here. So to say in his concession speech that he is an American, and, I, and that relationship we have means more to me than anything else, very important. The other thing he says that, I, I mean, it's just, I, I've never let the words go since he said it, he said, nothing about America is inevitable. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we can think that, look, we got past slavery. We got through several wars. We got through the Cold War. Like things just work out for this country. Our, the framers of, of our country often use the word providence, that this is just a divine act, that we're under the care of God and nothing can stop this thing from coming together. Mm-hmm. It's not true. 
The only reason the nation is the way it is today is because people that were here before us who didn't like what they saw forced the nation to be better. Uh, but as McCain said, nothing about this is inevitable. If we take for granted the progress we've made, then we risk losing it for the next generation and perhaps failing the um, this experiment of trying to build a multiracial egalitarian uh, society. So McCain's concession speech, as beautiful as Barack Obama's speech was that night and as meaningful as it was for this moment, especially McCain's speech speaks to the, the very heart of, I think, what's challenging the nation today. Wow, that's beautiful. And I, I really had goosebumps here. You know, it's, you know, we're talking about, uh, I mean, no joke, you know, we're talking about this American ex experiment, right? And we overlooked, as you said earlier, the fact that this is new. It has not been done anywhere, what we're attempting to do. And in these few centuries that we've tried this and had our mistakes and our triumphs, you know, together, uh, trial and error, we've become the superpower. superpower. We are the you know epitome we're the epitome of of uh what a country should look like so we think and that mm -hmm. but that does not come without the ability like james baldwin said and you quoted in the book the ability or the obligation to criticize mm -hmm. our country if it's not doing what we ask it to do you know we have that right and that obligation so wouldn't it be just extraordinary if we could somehow lead the way there, right? It, right, we right. Could, it, we could say, you know, this was this was an idea that we had in America 250 years ago, and now we're going to live into it all the way and and show others the way. And I really have to say, Dr. Johnson, that I feel like your book is a, uh, I wish it were taught in every um, schoolhouse in America, because I think it, it's, a, it's a path for us to get there. Mm, I appreciate that. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks, Liz, for all the work that you and your remarkable team has done. And Ted, we're going to bring you back plenty of times. You know, I, and you, I know you're working on a remarkable book, new book that's going to hit pretty soon. So we're going to be able to look out for that. And to everyone who is here with us tonight, on behalf of Florida Humanities and the Village Square and our streaming partners, we'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Hey there. It's Vanessa back with you sitting over here, just completely in awe of this whole program. You know how when you're wrestling with something in your own life, you can look around and see all these similarities and pull lessons from places you might not have otherwise seen them. Well, that happened to me over and over and over during this program. And while Dr. Johnson was talking, he basically just broke it all down and explained it all while talking about completely different subjects too. So that makes me realize how brilliant he is and likely right about maybe everything. You know, that part about our nation acting in its own interests, often for the perceived survival of the nation, totally fascinating. And it's crazy. I was just having a conversation with my husband the other day where we were debating an issue in our local community. It had nothing to do with race, but what Dr. Johnson described still completely applies it was the same concept applied to a different issue. So in this little debate, I was taking a super idealistic view of the issue, which I realized later was actually the simplistic approach. So at the time, to me, there was simply right and wrong, period. That's it. End of story. And I really wasn't hearing my husband the first time we talked. But after several conversations and a little help from a friend, I started to hear him more as he complicated the narrative. And thanks to Amanda Ripley for that term, she was featured in episode 40, High Conflict. And wow, what she talked about with that was so brilliant. Anyway, so my husband complicated the situation by throwing in all these other factors that I had never thought about 
I didn't really want to think about them, honestly, from my simplistic perch on my moral soapbox. But once I started listening, I realized there was more to it. And he did have logic and sound reasoning on his side after all. Now, in full disclosure, I still firmly do believe that I'm right. But since this is an evolving situation, and I know more conversations are to come, it was essential that I stretched toward understanding another perspective. So while our situation has nothing to do with the race, like I said, it still helps me see exactly what Dr. Johnson is talking about regarding the influence of an institution's interests and the need to shift our persuasion tactics if we're going to be effective. We can't make those shifts if we're stuck in a purely idealistic place where I'm right and everything you say is wrong and evil, often while I'm not really even listening to know for sure. See y'all, this is why I say I'm just a flawed human on this journey with my fellow Americans, learning and hopefully growing as I go. I hope you found some nuggets in this program that you can apply to your own life as well. Okay, before we say goodbye, we'd like to give a huge thank you to Florida Humanities for partnering with us to present this podcast series. We're grateful to them for their ongoing support. And we'd like to quickly introduce you to another timely podcast dedicated to saving our democracy. Check this out from Democracy Decoded. If you're like me, you're probably a bit frustrated with the state of our political system today. There's no getting around it. There's a lot to be frustrated about. So why does American democracy look the way it does? And how can we make it more responsive to the people it was formed to serve? I'm Simone Leeper, host of Democracy Decoded, a podcast where we examine our government and discuss innovative ideas that could lead to a stronger, more transparent, accountable, and inclusive democracy. In season one, we'll take you on a journey where we delve into the nuts and bolts of our campaign finance system. We'll look at the effects of secret spending at both the federal and state level, explore where and how foreign governments are spending to attempt to influence American elections, and investigate the fight against the outsized influence wealthy special interests have on local elections. Democracy Decoded is a production of Campaign Legal Center. Find us at democracydecoded.org or wherever you get your podcasts. All right, let's also give a shout out to our friends at the Democracy Group for introducing us to Democracy Decoded and many other important podcasts working to fix what's broken in our democracy. To stay up to date with all that's happening with the Village Square, subscribe to our newsletter at villagesquare.us. And subscribe to Village Squarecast wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate you listening to When the Stars Begin to Fall with Dr. Theodore R. Johnson. Until next time, we challenge you to reach out with an open heart and mind to someone who doesn't look or think like you. It changes everything. We'll talk to you soon. And thanks for listening to Village Squarecast. <laughs>